This is episode 41 of the Indie Film Academy podcast. Today we're talking with Steve Kaplan about the hidden tools of comedy. So... One of crossbeam's gone out of school on channel. Pardon? One of crossbeam's gone out of school on channel. I don't understand what you're saying. One of the crossbeams has gone out of skew on the treadle. <laughs> what on earth does that mean? I don't know. Mr. Wentworth just told me to come in here and say that there was trouble at the mill, that's all. I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Our chief weapon is surprise. Surprise and fear. Fear and surprise. Our two weapons are fear and surprise and ruthless efficiency. Our three weapons are fear and surprise and ruthless efficiency and an almost fanatical devotion to the Pope. Our four, no. <laughs> Amongst our weapons. Amongst our weaponry are such elements as fear. Sur- I'll come in again. <laughs> I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Amongst our weaponry are such diverse elements as fear, surprise, ruthless vigilance, and almost fanatical devotion to the Pope and nice red uniform. Oh, damn it. <laughs> I, I can't say it. You'll have to say it. What? You'll have to say the bit about our chief weapons. Ah, oh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hello and welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Buff. Today we are talking with Steve Kaplan, author of the book The Hidden Tools of Comedy. He's also the creator of the HBO Workspace, creator of the HBO New Writers Program. So we'll be talking to Steve in just a second. I really had a great talk with him, and we also add a lot of fun little clips and things in there so that you can really get a feel for the the topics we're talking about. But, you know, I also wanted to mention that it's been a while. You know, I haven't done a podcast since December, and I've really really missed this and we have a lot of great guests coming up. I hope that you guys will tune in. I'm going to go back to doing a weekly thing now after this little break and we'll be back into our, you know, our groove. What I've primarily been doing over the holidays is writing and I, I've been focusing on writing the screenplay, but I've found some really amazing resources online that this time around have been helping me. One of the best resources that I found online is Scott Myers go into the story blog. It's amazing. And he also has a Facebook group that you can join. And he's just, you, know, you can go to his website and they break down screenplays and discuss them. And he gives a lot of great advice. So if you're a screenwriter and not going to go into the story, I, I really think you're missing out. Also, another podcast that I've been listening to a lot that, I, that I've always been aware of and I've listened to a number of episodes, but, but I really just started binge listening to Script Notes with John August. That is an absolutely excellent resource. I just listened to their episode on Whiplash, and it goes in, and it, they they will read the screenplay, and then they'll listen to the film from you know the actual film that was made, and talk about the differences and the things that could have worked better. And it's just an incredible uh, resource. Also, one of my guests coming up is going to be Pilar Alessandra of On the Page, and she's also an amazing resource. You know, her web her um, podcast has been around a lot longer than mine, and that's one of the podcasts that I listen to. And if you follow us, you know that we just published my top 25 podcasts for filmmaking and all those, you know, all the podcasts there were were mentioned on it. So check that out. I think you'll find if you listen to those podcasts, you'll get a lot out of it. There's a listening to podcasts is one of the best ways to learn filmmaking. You can just put it on, you know, when you work out, when you walk, when you're in your car, wherever, just listen to people talking about filmmaking. You you just learn an enormous amount that way. And another way to learn is audiobooks. And if you want to get two free filmmaking audiobooks, just go to ifafreebooks.com and you can download books like Scott McMahon, Surviving the Hollywood Implosion, or Robert McKee's Story. They have a ton of great filmmaking books that you can just listen to and it, it's like a master class on any subject. Um, ifafreebooks.com So check that out. Alright. Let's get to the, to the, the meat. <laughs> uh, here's my interview with Steve Kaplan. came to Los Angeles, what were you... Did you immediately open up a theater company or how did that work well uh, i actually came to los angeles first uh we uh in new york we did uh, we were running this theater called manhattan punchline and uh, we used to do a a one-act festival every year so a bunch of people 
wanted to bring uh, a number of one acts out to Los Angeles. And so that's what originally brought me out there. They, uh, uh, I helped them uh, put up this evening of one acts uh, and uh, I knew I was going to stay. So I came out, I did a little theater, but then I tried to get a, a, a real, you know, big boy pants, grown up job. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it took me a little bit of time. Uh, but uh, eventually I hooked up with uh, Chris Albrecht at HBO I pitched him an idea, and uh, he he ran with it. And first we did the HBO New Writers Project, um, and that ran for a couple of years. And then he started the uh, Aspen Comedy Festival, and uh, in support of that, uh, with a couple of other people, we opened up a performance space in Los Angeles called the HBO Workspace. Um, it's now uh, being run by Comedy Central. And what we did was we helped facilitate their search for comedians and comics. And at the same time, we were uh, producing shows and uh, showcasing people, uh, both for HBO executives, uh, uh, for them to take a look at, and also just uh, to uh, kind of be an asset and a, and a service to the community. So, uh, so that's what originally, that's what I originally did in Los Angeles. And, um, uh, then I, I got involved in management, um, mm. uh, talent management. And I, uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I realized, Hey, I'm no good at this. <laughs> Uh, because did you just did you tell your clients that one day you're like well, oh, no, well you know, I, by the way eventually eventually uh, the the clients that were left to me uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> I I told but uh, it, the 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 terrible thing about uh, I wasn't an agent I was a manager mm-hmm. and and the terrible thing about being a manager uh, is that uh, you're you know, especially for me because I took everything very personally so if somebody said ah oh, this person's not good for this job. Um, oh, I don't like the script. I I, I felt devastated. <laughs> it was like um, it was like getting broke up with by a girl every 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 week. Right. Uh, and when and when clients leave uh, left me, um, it was really like getting broke up with a girl, uh, especially when they started the conversation. You know, Steve, I like you as a person. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, I, I I I when I was in my dating years, I used to hear that a lot. So I realized that that wasn't. It, that wasn't my metier. It was kind mm-hmm. of a, a, a zig when I should have zagged. Uh, and uh, along the way, uh, I had run into a guy, and uh, uh, and and funny, you know, funny story. He was uh, he was showcasing a show, and and I happened to leave <laughs> in the middle of the show because it was <laughs> it was not very good. And and amazingly enough. Uh, Years later, he uh, got in touch with me uh, to take a look at a script. Uh, so I, I looked at a script and I gave him notes. And, and uh, again, I, I, I was more cruel than kind. Uh, and amazingly enough, a couple of years later, he said to me, um, and this is when I was really, I was, I was about to say this, this whole management thing was a wrong move. Uh, and he said, I'm working with Robert McKay. And I think you could do for uh, comedy what Robert McKee does for story. And he said, have you ever taught uh, comedy to writers? And I said, well, I, I, I started out teaching comedy to actors uh, at my theater company. Um, I, and, and I've worked on a lot of scripts with a lot of playwrights. And I, as, I assume that I can, uh, this, this will translate over to writers. And from there, it, uh, from that little seed... A mighty oak grew. <laughs> uh, now, I mean, it, it seems such a a for for somebody who doesn't understand the concept of breaking up comedy and you know seeing what's going on and and why it's working and why people are are laughing at something. What what was kind of like that first step into teaching comedy? What were the first kind of like obvious things that that you found that people needed to to understand about comedy? Well, 
I mean, the well, you should understand that the theater company that I, I was running, um, uh, that I started with uh, two two other actors, uh, Manhattan Punchline, was a theater completely devoted to comedy. So that's okay. all we did. We produced comedy plays. We um, we showcased uh, improv groups. Michael Patrick King, who later went on to write Sex in the City and Two Broke Girls, was 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 uh, one of the leaders of this uh, improv group, along with. Um, you know, Don Marrero, who's now a, a very well-known stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. uh, we produced late-night uh, shows with stand-ups, uh, including Rita Rudner, uh, Jane Anderson, who's now a very famous playwright. Uh, and so that's all we did. And the first thing I noticed about comedy is that it's fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it's, it's elusive. Uh, I, would, I would be producing a show. And I would be standing in the back of the audience. And the show that was a riotous hit on Thursday was met with crickets on Sunday. And the actors would come off stage and they would say, what a terrible audience. Mm -hmm. But I was standing in the audience and I wasn't terrible. And I was prepared to enjoy it. I might not laugh out loud as much as people who hadn't seen the show. But I, no I started noticing differences. I started noticing that there was a different approach to the material, a slight differentiation in, in how uh, the actors were meeting the material night by night. And that's what started me on the, uh, on the exploration that, that became a 40-week master class, which then became uh, a, a weekend workshop, which then became a book. <laughs> <laughs> which is now <laughs> translated into Chinese because God knows you need some funnier Chinese. Well, you know you've arrived. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, and and it's going to be translated into French. So so now we can be rude when we're funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe I shouldn't say. Finally, that. the French will have comedy. I'm supp I'm supp yeah, really. <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to be. Uh, supposed to be going to Paris in, in April, so so hopefully they will listen to that part of the podcast. <laughs> well, um, we have a big French, you know, listening. Exactly. So, so I, I started to notice that uh, that there were certain certain things that that were, for the most part, uh, unrecognized or or not thought to be. Uh, important or, or, or vital, uh, and these became what I called the hidden tools of comedy. I mean, uh, all the actors and, and the playwrights that I was working with, you know, they'd all gone to college or conservatory, and they all knew Uta Hagen and Stanislavski mm -hmm. uh, and, and great uh, playwriting techniques, but, but there were certain things that they they were not aware of that I started to become aware of only because I was standing in the back and, and oftentimes I was directing a play and I would start to notice that, that there were things that they did that decreased the comedy and things that they did that increased the comedy. So, uh, I mean, for instance, um, one of the things that, that kills comedy is if, if, you know, the actor knows too much, Mm -hmm. If the act, you know, uh, uh, in in acting class, this is called uh, anticipating. But what it really is is the actor is too aware of um, of what's happening, what's going on. Too, uh, in in fact, too smart. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that um, that I started to realize that were there, there were these principles that had not been taught anywhere or for the most part had not been taught and that great comics and comedians either picked up or knew by, by instinct. Um, but that could be analyzed and, and, uh, and presented and taught, uh, to people who hadn't spent their entire childhoods, uh, listening to all the George Carlin and, and Richard Pryor albums, for instance. Mm -hmm. Right. And oh and you would like to hear one of these. Yeah, that would be uh that would be helpful, yes. Okay, well that's right. <laughs> on this podcast. Uh okay. Uh so so there's there's the um there's the uh, t dynamic of straight line wavy line and that's that's my terminology for it. Okay. Which which basically means that rather than 
uh, a straight man and a comic. Everybody thinks that, you know, if you see a duo, there's a comic, a funny person doing funny things, and uh, a straight man who's just kind of, or a straight woman who's just kind of setting things up. And Mm -hmm. I, I came to realize that that dynamic is false, that it's not about a funny guy doing funny things and other people just kind of setting them up. It's really about uh, somebody who is blind to the problem or creating the problem and somebody who's struggling with the problem but unable to solve it because they're, they're flawed. They're, they're just a, a flawed human being. Mm-hmm. When, when, for instance, when John Cleese started Monty Python, uh, he said that when they started Monty Python, he thought that comedy was watching somebody do something funny. What they came to realize is comedy is watching somebody watch somebody do something funny. Yes, you know, it's a man's life in England's mountains green. Look, I heard that, I heard that. I'm going to stop this sketch now. And if there's any more of this, I'm going to stop the whole program. I thought it was supposed to be about teeth anyway. Why can't you do something about teeth? Go on. What about my rustic monologue? I'm not sleeping with that producer again. Comedy is the person who is kind of like us, struggling with some idiot. So that if you put Jerry Seinfeld and Kramer in a room, yes, it looks like Kramer is doing all the funny stuff. But without Jerry being a human being kind of perplexed and amused and confused by Kramer, there's no comedy. How's life on the red planet? It's killing me. I can't eat, I can't sleep. All I can see is that giant red sun in the shape of a chicken. Well, did you go down to the Kenny Rogers and complain? Oh, they gave me the heave hole. You know, I don't think that Kenny Rogers has any idea what's going on down there. What are you doing? That, that's tomato juice. That looked like milk to me. <laughs> Jerry, my rods and cones are all screwed up. All right, that's it. I gotta move in with you, Jerry. Oh. I don't know, Kramer. Uh, my concern is that living together after a while, we you know, might start to get on each other's nerves a little. Listen to me, I got a great idea. Now, you're a heavy sleeper, right? Why don't we just switch apartments? Or I could sleep in the park. You could knock these walls down, make it an eight-room luxury suite. Jerry, these are load-bearing walls. They're not going to come down. Yeah, that's no good. I may have to drive that place out of business. Well, how are you going to do that? Like we did in the 60s. Taking it to the streets. That's one of the things that I, I, you know, mentioning that, I always remember like Conan O'Brien, one of the things that makes his skit so funny is having something completely insane happening. And then you don't really laugh until you, the camera cuts back to Conan's reaction to it. Exactly. So if, right. you, if you start, if you watch sitcoms, good sitcoms, you'll notice that, that the, the comedy really, the comedy is, the comedy circuit is completed when there's a reaction to the craziness, not just the craziness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so what seems to be the easy part, the, the straight man, really is essential to, to comedy. And if you watch uh, a good SNL sketch, and there aren't, you know, not every SNL sketch is good, but a good <laughs> SNL sketch right. is the comedy is the human being in the equation. It's the, it's the person who's being weirded out by the weird stuff that's happening and it's only underscored by the idiot who's not paying any attention. Right. So, uh, there, I mean, just the other night, uh, on SNL, there were, uh, you know, Adam driver was on. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, yep. I, I guess he didn't get such great reviews. Somebody said, well, it's not Trump SNL bad, but, <laughs> but there was a, there was a, there was a great, uh, Aladdin sketch. Uh-huh. In, in which he's flying on the magic carpet and um uh and 
the uh, the girl. I I can't remember. I think it's um, Cecily Strong. I think I yeah, think that's yeah. who it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is on the magic carpet, and first a b- bird flies into her, and then uh, <laughs> you know, a bomb drops in her because they're over Syria, and she keeps on getting weirded out, and then she keeps on trying to get back into the romantic moment, and that is so human. Mm-hmm. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Jeff, you know, uh, Aladdin, uh, as played by Adam Driver, is completely oblivious. So that's the perfect example of straight line, wavy line. Somebody who's on a straight track, like has blinders on, blind to the problem or creating the problem. And somebody else who's struggling with the problem, but because they're, they're what we call a non-hero, uh, mm-hmm. unable to solve the problem. And, and a non-hero is another is another thing that that uh, or principle that that we talk about in which it's not about being a, a ridiculous person a, a clown you know a a, a silly clown mm-hmm. uh, it's really just about somebody who lacks some if not all the essential tools and skills with which to win so sometimes the most basic skill uh, with which to win is simply knowing so so one of the best directions you can ever give in comedy is don't know so much don't know and what that means is that if something happens don't because you've read the script and you know what's happening on this page and what's going to happen on the next page don't react like you've got it i understand it be confused let there be doubt Mm -hmm. um doubt is is the friend of comedy Uh, being being unsure is the friend of comedy uh, and being sure, uh, being certain about things is dramatic. It be, it just becomes being self-reflective is a dramatic moment. And what we found out is that these principles aren't just here's how you be funny. It's really about here's how you can modulate the levels of comedy or drama in a scene. You want a character to be more dramatic, make them give them more skills, make them more empathetic, more sensitive more kind, more knowing, make them, uh, make them less comic, take away those skills, create uh, a comedy, create a, a strong straight line, wavy line relationship, create a dramatic moment, have everybody uh, make, uh, you know, make eye contact and be empathetic with each other and, and have them, have them share the scene. So those, those kinds of things don't apply just to comedy, but you can actually uh, modulate the amount of comedy and drama in a scene by increasing or decreasing these principles. When you're talking about, you know, you would see one show and then you'd see the same show and it wasn't funny for, for well, whatever well, reason. Were those well, improv in, shows or were they literally saying the same things? In, in that in that case, what's what's happening is the actors will subtly begin to adjust their performance so they look less ridiculous because nobody in the world wants to look like an idiot. And so in a comedy, sometimes the characters are doing idiotic things, but the actors will subtly, subtly uh, just make an adjustment so that it's a little bit more understandable, appropriate, logical, and rational. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's why a a script is sometimes the funniest the first time the actors get around the table to read it, because the actors aren't aware of of how stupid they're going to sound when they say this line. Once they (laughs) understand how stupid they sound, they either make it sound stupider, and uh, again, to put on a mask to protect themselves, or they make it sound just slightly less stupid. Uh, Here's an example. It's hard to to, uh, think of a, a film or TV show where you can see somebody anticipating, although, you know, they, uh, they used to talk about how they would have to trick the three stooges into not knowing when the pie is coming. Because okay. if they knew when the pie was coming, it wouldn't be funny. So what they would say is that, okay, we're going to hit you on three, one, two, and they would hit him on two. They would do <laughs> everything they could. And uh, these guys were hit with thousands of pies. So right. they would go to great lengths to try to fool them when the pie was coming. Because if they knew when the pie was coming, it wouldn't just be that they would flinch. They would subtly react that, Oh, I'm going to get hit. But mm-hmm. a better example is uh, is like bad comedy. Like um, I- I'm not a fan of late Jerry Lewis. I love early Jerry Lewis. 
Because uh-huh. right. if you watch early Jerry Lewis, like At Home in the Army, um, mm-hmm. uh, I think the first movie he made with Dean Martin, he is so innocent, so sweet, so unknowing. But later, when when you know the French have told him he's a genius, he's he just twists himself into a pretzel, as though as though to say, if you just looked at me, you wouldn't see an idiot. So I'm going to have to pretend I'm an idiot. Right. Uh, so, you know, just think of any bad comedy, you know, um, something bad with Rob Schneider, uh, <laughs> Grown Ups 2, in okay. which people are acting, are, are pretending to be idiots. And mm-hmm. my point of view, what I always tell writers and actors, is that you don't have to pretend we are idiots. <laughs> I mean, we, right. that's who we are. We're human beings. We're, 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 you know, these stupid doofuses who are bumbling around this, this planet, you know, hurtling through space, you know, making up all sorts of reasons why. And we don't know. We just don't know. Uh, so, so the art of comedy is actually the art of telling the truth about what it's like to be human. Mm -hmm. It, It seems like the, the moment somebody is trying to intentionally be funny or you see something like, you know, you can kind of see that, oh, look, they're trying to be funny right now. Right. Is the moment that it just, it's not funny at all. You know, and you see, seem to see that in a lot of these comedies that they're just like, especially, let's say, whatever Kevin James movie, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to have this wacky thing and uh, let's do all these situations where, oh, he's going to be put into this situation and that situation. And it's just like, it, there's nothing funny about it. Maybe for like a five year old, but it just doesn't, doesn't work. Well, I haven't seen, uh, Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. I, I, have to, I have to admit that. <laughs> I have seen it. Uh, you have seen it? Yeah. Was it great? It was so good. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's like I, I, love, I love watching bad movies as well as good movies because you get to kind of like put it together and, and you know, I mean, it just it, – it has a couple let, of let, moments. Let me, but I mean, let me ask you this. Having okay. not seen it, have right. you seen Hitch? I've seen Hitch, yes, with uh, what's Will Smith. With, what's the difference in Kevin James between Hitch and uh, Paul Blart Mall Cop 2? Um, he's got a slight accent and fake teeth, I think is the only difference. That's the only difference? Well, I don't really remember Hitch that well. He wasn't, I mean, he I, plays, I... He plays this sweaty guy who wants to marry, who wants to get with a supermodel. Right. I can't... And what I remember about Hitch... Okay. Is that he was recognizable? He he was like one of us. Okay. And he he was a little clumsy, but mm-hmm. he but he wasn't uh, such an exaggerated clown that he was no longer recognizable as human. Right. Whereas I'm guessing in Mall Cop Two, uh, he does things that no no sentient human being would do. Because somebody <laughs> thought, wouldn't it be funny if? Right. Yeah, well, uh, you know, most of the movie is that, you know, and a lot of things, all these situations happen that aren't, that that really aren't, you know, believable. So I think you're kind of watching it like, oh, that's kind of funny or whatever, but you don't, you, you're not brought into the story. You don't actually believe any of these characters are real. Right. You know? So if, if you look at a movie like, um, the other guys with uh, Will Farrell and and Mark Wahlberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a moment in which, uh, in which they're walking away from a store and the store explodes, and then they're on the ground and Will Farrell's going, "It hurts." They never tell you it hurts. <laughs> they just walk away, and that's the essence of comedy: is noticing what's around you and uh-huh. being uh, and being aware of the uh, inconsistencies, the absurdities. What Dorothy Parker called having a sharp eye and a wild mind. The accounting firm is closed at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday. Oh, this is a shithole. I love bombs. I can't hear! Uh, I can't hear! I can't. There's blood blisters on my head! Oh my god, how do they walk away in movies without flinching when it explodes behind them? There's no way! I call bullshit on that! When they flew the Millennium Falcon outside of the Death Star and it was followed by the explosion! That was bullshit! Don't you damn bad Star Wars! That was all accurate! I need an MRI! 
I need an MRI. I've got soft tissue damage. There's no way I don't have soft tissue damage. I just want to go somewhere and breastfeed right now. So, so when a comic comes out in a club and says, uh, and says, hey, you in the front row, and starts to make a comment, that's the essence of comedy, which is noticing what's around you and not taking it for granted, and, and mm-hmm. seeing the absurdity in it, and, and, share, and, and being confused by it, not necessarily knowing all about it and being uh, a dick about it, but, but just kind of commenting on it in a way that both expresses what you feel and also questions it, and, and doesn't doesn't quite know what the answer is, mm-hmm. which is why uh, a, a comic is, what about that? What's the deal with? It's a question. It's not a statement. Once you're making right. statements, you're, you're, you're a politician. Mm-hmm. A question is a, co- is a comedian. I so, think. yeah, I mean, what, what do you think is, I mean, do you feel like, for example, when I'm writing, I, I, I you know, I'm also a writer. Um, a lot of the things. Great. By the way, oh, thank you. I love it. It's <laughs> golden. The comedy for me, like I grew up always seeing things as being comic, you know, and, and when I was in as early as I can remember, I would be in just situations and just start laughing and people would even get mad at me because I would talk into somebody and just all their little quirks and things would just like something would come out of that and I'd start laughing and they'd be like, well, what, what's so funny? You know, and there's they'd medication get, for get mad at me. <laughs> yeah, well. Ah, oh, thank God. Um, but, and when I, when I write, it's like, it's impossible. Even if, I mean, the stuff that I write is more kind of character driven stuff, but right. it's the humor just comes out of it. It's like, I'm not even trying. And then once you have, once you really feel a character on the page living and breathing, just the, the humor just comes out of it without even trying to do anything, just their actions. Exactly. And I, I've never looked into it deeper to try and dissect why it's funny, but it just seems like that it's like, I don't even know why it's funny, but it's funny the, when you have like a real character and they do something that you're just like, oh, that's, you know, that's that character. You know, that's well, how they do stuff. Well, in the course, what I, what I say is that the, the value of the course is, is not to take what you do and change it entirely. It's not, it's not a methodology. It's not, mm-hmm. here's how you make the sausage, but it's, it's a toolbox and you use tools when something is broken. So if, if you're writing and everything's working, great. Don't look at it. Don't say, well, what is Blake Snyder and, and, and Robert McKee and Steve Kaplan. No, just keep going. But when there's a scene that doesn't work, that's when you can use a tool. Um, that's when you can try to figure out what we teach is what comedy is, how it works, why it works, what's going on when it's not working, and what can you do about it. So when you, if you have something that's not working, then you have some tools to try to figure out. How, and if you want the scene to be comic, um, that's when you can figure out, well, what could I do here? Can I, can I use a metaphorical relationship? Can I, is, should there be a straight line, wavy line relationship? Now, when you look at somebody like, um, Judd Apatow, and I, I just recently watched again, uh, this is 40. It just seems like so much of that, we're, we're always kind of riding this line between what's kind of going too far, what's going to be something to, and, and, uh, you know, with a lot of the comedy podcasts too, the comedy is not coming out of people trying to be funny. It's coming out of really difficult situations and people people, you know, fighting about things and, and whatever. What, what did, how do you look at that kind of comedy versus all these kind of stupid slapstick kind of, you know, silly comedies? Well, I mean, my, my favorite comedies are the comedies that tell the truth about, about people. Now, it could, you could tell the truth in a fantastical situation like Groundhog Day, one of my favorite comedies. But m- one of my other favorite comedies is 40-Year-Old Virgin. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons I love 40-Year-Old Virgin is because they don't make him a ridiculous character. You know, after the poker game, and you know, he's kind of ridiculous. He's he's riding a bike. He's never <laughs> he's, he's 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 you know he's frozen in this adolescence. But mm. after the poker game, he's humiliated. Answer this question: Are you a virgin? <laughs> Are you a virgin? Yeah, yeah, not, not since I was ten. It all makes sense. You're a virgin. I am. Shut up. How does that happen? He's a fucking virgin. Oh, I knew it. That makes so much sense, oh, man. Look, he's a virgin. You guys, wait, 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 wait. You, you guys are hilarious. All right, all right, all right. Come on, don't be mean. I'm not being mean. I'm yeah. trying to help the pot now. I'm trying to say I want to get you laid, dude. I, I understand what's going on. You guys here, are right? so up your asses. Oh, <laughs> 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 
the back of sin. Come on, man. You can do better than that. Y'all be so haunting. Y'all be so stupid. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> I, uh, it's going to be fine. They don't even remember. Those guys are cool. And you feel for him. It's not like, ah, he, it's not like some, I don't know Rob Schneider. I, I, I assume he's a very nice guy <laughs> and a talented guy. I, I'm just using, uh-huh. Rob, if you were listening to this, I'm just using you as kind of an icon of not good comedy. Without Rob, this is, I, none so of this I, is coming I from me, Rob. This uh, is so, all Steve. So, I mean, they're not just making him some idiot. They're humanizing him. And he goes, he he rides home. Uh, he, he has this primal scream. And it's so in touch with true emotions, what we would all be going through. And then he goes back into work and he thinks, maybe I'll just, maybe they won't remember it. And <laughs> you know, they say, hi, how you doing? And all yeah. of a sudden everybody's ragging on him. And, uh, yeah. and, and uh, you know, let's get the virgin laid. And he runs out <laughs> the store. And the thing that made me love the movie was, was Paul Rudd running after him, trying to help him. Right human sweet uh not ridiculous so they never you know yes there are some outlandish very very broad things in that movie but for the most part it's grounded in in a human condition in the in in what would happen to us Mm -hmm. uh Chris Rock was talking about the, his evolution as, as a filmmaker and he was talking about that that he's learned a lot from Louis C.K. And that mm-hmm. now, uh, whereas in the past he would go for any joke possible, but now, uh, especially with um, uh, his, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, Five Things or yeah, I, Top I know what Five, you're Top about. Five, yeah. uh, that he basically said, put somebody in a situation and say, what would they do now? Right. And to me, that's the best way to develop a comic premise is you come up with a, with a fantastic premise something that's impossible or implausible and then put in, you know, our typical comedy comedy characters and then see what would they do now? What would happen now? And develop it, like you say, through character as opposed to plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's interesting, you know, going back to the 40 year, 40 year old virgin. One of the things that people forget about that is if you go later in the film, once his relationship with Catherine Keener develops, it actually becomes a very like, you know, it, it's still comic and everything, but it's more like it's a real heartwarming story, you know. And he's, you know, showing the dealing with the daughter and all that stuff, you know what I mean? I, I love, I love that scene where, where he's like, you know, I speak sarcasm too, and he's got, you know, he does a magic trick, and she's like, Do you walk around with an ear in your pocket, you know? I mean, I but, love those scenes, but they're not like, you know, they're they're more of like a drama, you know, it's like a real story. It's and and. Because they because they don't feel the the need to do a joke or a bit every ten seconds. The, the a favorite scene of mine is when he takes the daughter to the Planned Parenthood, the the uh, uh, the clinic. Now you're all here because you're interested in obtaining birth control. Any questions? <clears throat> Here's a cute story. I came home the other day, and he is with his girlfriend in my marital bed doing things that are illegal in Alabama. Sex acts, right? Things that my wife won't do, okay? Did you have a question? How do I get my wife to do that? Does anybody else have a question? My daughter is, uh, for lack of a better word, dumb. How do I stop her menstrual cycle? You want her to stop having a menstrual cycle? I want to stop it maybe just for a few years. Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. Does anybody else have a question? Um, I have uh, I have a question. I think some of the people here might be sexually inexperienced. Is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? Is that a serious question? No, it wasn't. Okay. Now, there are a lot of activities that you can engage in without having sex that are both fun and safe. What sort of activities? I think um, everybody wants to know about the activities. Uh, well, instead of having intercourse, you could have... Outer course. Outer course? Oh, what's that? Yeah, what is that? Well, outer course is anything that isn't vaginal intercourse. I prefer vaginal intercourse. <laughs> he really does. 
Now, there are ways of having sex without intercourse. Uh, let's see. There are things like body rubbing or dry humping. You could dry hump. Uh, there's masturbation. Masturbation. Play with yourself. Mutual masturbation. Play with a friend. Deep kissing. Um, there's erotic massage. Oh, that sounds like it would be nice. Oral sex play. Sounds like my Friday night. Oh, shut up, Seth. We went to Temple. Okay, are there any virgins here who are thinking about having sex for the first time? Oh. Wait, wait. <laughs> so, so you're a virgin? <laughs> <laughs> I tapped that. Oh, yeah, you tapped that. Seth, what, you think you're cool with your little jufro? We don't say tap that. What, what, what are you talking about, Seth? You know what? I'm a virgin, too. <laughs> hey, you, that's <laughs> we're virgins too. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know what? It's a it's it's a personal choice, and okay. Um, I can't listen to any more of this because it's making me sick. So bye. You can get this information on your website, all right? Oh yes. Thanks. Nice meeting everybody. Any other questions? Do you have any extra large condoms? Oh, Seth, you got a tiny penis. Mm-hmm. And he's asking more questions than anybody else. But then he's sitting around all these people, all these, all the, you know, the the kid who thinks he's hot stuff, and and uh, the guy who just wants, you know, his daughter to be. You know, can we not, can we make sure that she doesn't have any sex till she's thirty <laughs> five? And then on the drive home, um, uh, the daughter just turns to him and says, "You're a virgin, right?" And he's and rather than pretending mm-hmm. which which some some uh script teachers will teach will tell you that the the key to comedy is deception and you know that's such a uh I, yeah sometimes but but if if you take that to its logical illogical you know to its logical conclusion you never tell anybody the truth and that's exhausting it's exhausting Mm -hmm. Um, And what I love about the scene is he just says, yeah, but don't tell your mom, okay? Well, when are you going to do it? Well, I'm getting around to it. It's so – I keep on going back to that word. It's human. It Mm -hmm. tells the truth about the human condition. Drama helps us dream about what we could be, but comedy helps us live with who we are. Comedy is the truth. Drama is is the exaggeration. Drama is the idealization of life. Would that we were – as tortured and as sensitive and as poetic and as intellectual as Hamlet, right? We're watching Hamlet. Oh, what he's going through. Have you ever seen a production of Hamlet? Um, I've seen the movies okay. <laughs> of Hamlet. Okay, you've seen a movie like, of Hamlet. Have you ever yeah. seen in the movie, did Hamlet fart? Not in the ones I saw. Not in the, so what, would, <laughs> what, what do you think would happen if Hamlet's going to be or not to be? <laughs> I probably would enjoy it a lot more. Uh, and but yet yeah, people do fart, right? Yeah. So that is true. so, but by making him more human, you make it immediately more comic. So I hate comedies that pretend, or let me let me put it this way: I hate comedies where every ten seconds they're going, "Wouldn't it be funny if this happened? Wouldn't it be funny if that happened?" Because mm-hmm. I'm more interested in what would happen if this really happened to these characters. What would they do? What would all these different characters do because you don't have to invent shit you don't have to make shit up put three people in a room they're going to go in three different directions half the time they're going to run into each other because that's who human beings are so just let them let them deal with the situation in their own way if you if you haven't duplicated characters you're going to create your conflict and your obstacles just because of the characters you have on screen or on stage in that situation I do a uh, an experiment in in my workshops. We call it the classic the classic problem of the three lawyers. I have three people come up. I make sure that they're not actors or improvisers. Uh, I ask for writers who have never performed, and I tell them they're all three lawyers, and that the most important case of their careers began in a courthouse four blocks away five minutes ago. And I say that if you through that door. In whatever room that we're in, whatever meeting room or banquet room we're in, I say through that door is is the courthouse uh, four blocks away. You're five minutes late, and then I then I have two of them leave, and I tell each one separately that for some crazy reason they have to be the second person out the door. 
And I'll do that for everyone. I'll say, listen, this is going to be, I'm going to give everybody something different. But for you, I just want you to know that for some crazy reason, you have to be the second person out the door. And then I'll bring all three of them back and I'll say, start. And what will happen is most times that they'll run to the door and they'll stop. And the audience, of course, knows what's happening. And there, there will be this great dance of trying to figure out how to get, how to be the second person out the door if they're all trying to leave. Uh, and then uh, I'll usually say to uh, shout out, you have my, you have the permission to win. In which case, uh, I, I usually put two big guys and a small girl in the group. <laughs> you, and you you see, you're anticipating, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll say you, I give you the permission to win. And usually one of the big guys will pick up the small girl, throw her out, and then he'll be the second <laughs> guy to go. And it's usually a very funny scene. And, and when I did this at DreamWorks once with three animators who have never performed, uh, mm. the one animator was this tall, skinny guy. And the two guys tried to throw him out of the room, and he put one foot on one side of the door and one foot on the other side of the door, and he was, like, completely horizontal. It was, it was amazing. I've never seen that before. <laughs> and, and my point is that like a cat. You, don't need, you don't need clever dialogue. You don't even need, uh, you don't need directors. You don't even need writers. You just need characters, humans, in a situation with, a, with something unusual or not easy and see what happens. And, you, and half the time, more than half the time, comedy will, will occur. Now, you raise an important, important topic about characters and, and having two characters um, interacting. Do you feel like you need to have... For example, one guy who's going to be the straight man, one guy who's going to be the, the you know the comic part or whatever you want to say. I mean, when you're when you're creating comic moments, do you have to have that sort of conflict between your characters? Uh, when when you're talking about characters, you don't. It's not so much the conflict. It's it's you want our typical character. If you think about any commedia troupe, you would have the lecherous old man, the, the wily, tricky, clever servant, the young innocent, the fool, and you you just make sure that you have those archetypical types in in your story. I mean, who is the um, think of you know just in terms of Winnie the Pooh? Who's your Tigger? Who's your Eeyore? You know who mm. who's your who's your Pooh? <laughs> who's the Tin Man? Who you know this is Chris Soth who you know who talks about you know the 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 Wizard of Oz method of character development. You uh-huh. know who's the Tin Man? Who's the Scarecrow? Who's the who's the Lion? The, the the child the the animal uh, the 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 thinker so yeah you it's not no one is a straight man Paul Rudd is not a straight man in in forty year old virgin although he's more the voice of reason than anybody else but he's got his own thing because he's you know pining for Mindy Kaling uh, and he's this he's this romantic who's who's all you know fucked up in his head. So, so I, I don't think that the whole idea that there's a straight man is, again, is, is a misnomer and I think, I think a false dynamic. Uh, if you take a look at the other guys, at any one moment, one of them is insane and the other one is sane but not quite knowing what to do in this situation. When Will Farrell brings Mark Wahlberg home, he's married to some hottie. And all Mark Wahlberg can say is, is she really your wife? Oh. Hi. Hi. You must be Terry. I'm sorry I've been hiding, honey, but this dinner was tricky. Oof. Who are you? I'm Dr. Sheila Gamble, his wife. Come on, seriously, who is that? His old lady. Sweetie, it's a workstation. Got it. And you come in here dressed like a hobo, it's distracting. I know you're working. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Come on, seriously. Come on, what? Who is that? It's the old, uh... To a ball and chain. Get over here. Mm. Not, not right now. Okay. Look, they're not all first round picks, okay? Come on, are you gonna tell me who that is? Are you really Alan's wife? Mm. I know. People are shocked because he's Episcopalian and I'm Catholic, but somehow it works. <clears throat> are you gonna change? Ooh, I already did. It's no big deal. You look really, really nice. Terry, you don't have to be polite, okay? She looks kind of shitty. Don't speak to her like that, Alan. Look, if I put that in my Cosmo fashion app, you'd, you'd probably get a D minus. Oof. 
Alan and his apps. He loves them. You know, he's designed three of his own. One of them, can I, can I tell him? Mm -hmm. One of them. You can take a picture of anybody's face, and I'll tell you what the back of his head looks like. Face back. Face back. I've got some horrible reviews coming out of the gate. It's going to hit. It's going to catch. Yeah. Why are you with Alan? I mean, that, that's not what I meant. I meant, um, how did you guys meet? It's a really typical how we met story, Terry. You're going to be bored by it. I was a dancer for the Knicks while finishing my residency at Columbia Hospital. Alan came into the ER with poison ivy on his rectum. Yes. Needless to say, I fell for him immediately. It's funny. It's like, it's like a scene from that one movie. Mm -hmm. Always forget the name of it. Uh, with Meg Ryan. Yes. I don't remember a movie where Meg Ryan meets a guy with poison ivy up his ass. I'll think of it. Okay. I'll think of it. So what about you, Terry? Do you have a girl? I did, yeah. We we're supposed to get married, but she backed out. It's complicated. Mm. Terry shot Derek Jeter. Shut up, Alan. This is before. That's okay. Ah, she's got mail. That's the name of the movie. That's it! Oh. Honey! With Tom Hanks? Mm -hmm. Right, and Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan. He doesn't have poison ivy up his ass. Oh, yes, he, yes did. he did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Way up there. Well, Terry, can't thank you enough for coming by. What a, what a wonderful, lovely evening. Thank you. So, so nice meeting you, Terry. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And remember, all I ask of you is you don't let him get hurt, Terry. She tells me that every day before I leave. Yep, I do. I come downstairs and I make him his fresh cut strawberries. And I say, listen, my little sugar balls, whatever you do today, you just don't get hurt. <laughs> yep, every morning. And then I show him my breasts and I say, these, these are waiting for you when right. you get back home. You know, Terry, they're, they're not the biggest breasts he's ever seen, but man, are they... Not, not by a long shot. ...perky, and they are firm, and they are yours. You're a nice lady. Oh, thank you for coming... Detectives Hoyts and Gamble. Detectives Hoyts and Gamble, over. Go for Hoyts. We found your red Prius. Great. Was trying to vote for Ralph Nader. Come on. Okay, Sugar Balls, listen up. It's going to be fingerprints in that car, and tomorrow we're going to run those fingerprints through the system. If we get a hit, this case is going to heat up faster than a junky spoon. You do one thing when you wake up tomorrow. Bring it. Okay. Thank you, Sheila. Oh, he'll bring it. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Sheila. Bye, Terry. Bye, Sheila. I'll never forget tonight. Bye, Terry. All right, Alan, whatever. Go inside. Bye, Sheila. Bye. See, you, see you, Terry. Bye, Sheila. <laughs> Who is she? It's just, and, and it's hysterical because one of them at, at, at any moment is aware of what's happening around him without having the complete uh, answer of what to do about it. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, too, is going back through the history um, – and talking about somebody like Buster Keaton. So for him, he's always been kind of an example for me of um, somebody for whom, like, for example, uh, you know, what happened with the silent films is he was hugely popular up there with Chaplin and everything. And the moment he was asked to speak, it changed the dynamic of his comedy. Well, and, you can't be the great stone face and speak at the same time. Right. So I, I was curious about if, if you – you know, went into any sort of thing like that, that people have to be in the right kind of comedy for their kind of personality or whatever. Uh, well, we, we do talk about the history of comedy just in term, just in terms of the development of Western comedy that comes from these archetypical characters that, mm -hmm. that, you know, was, uh, kind of codified in the commedia, but really goes back all the way to the Greeks, uh, okay. where the, the, uh, the new Greek comedy was all about, our typical characters, cowardly, bragged soldiers, uh, lecherous old men or miserly old men. And you see, you see these characters in Shakespeare, you see them in Moliere, you see them on sitcoms. Who's the idiot? Who's the, the wisecracker? Who's the, um, the, uh, the, the space cadet? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I've just described friends. <laughs> uh, so, right. so what you, what you want it, what you, what you, want to know is that is that these are typical characters appear and reappear and reappear in in dozens of movies uh and they they they're there for a reason because those they embody certain aspects of the human condition uh personified and it's a good idea to have a good mix of them do you need all of all of the different character types no but uh when I read scripts, sometimes I'll say you have three, three best friends. Do you really need three best friends? And they're all exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe one should be, uh, different. Um, or maybe they should, maybe they should be different. For instance, uh, here's, 
here's a uh, we do a comic premise exercise uh, where where we have uh, we break people up into groups and they they work on comic premises. Uh, so uh, let me give you a premise. Um, okay. uh, it's not a great movie, uh, but this is something that actually that, uh, that a group actually came up with. Um, so here's the premise of this comedy movie. Uh, a college football team discovers that the only time that they can win is when they get the nerd laid. <laughs> now, that's already a good start for a premise because it made you giggle. So tell uh-huh. me, who's in this movie? Well, you've got the jock. You've got the okay, nerd. What, what you've got the best the, friend. Excuse me. What position is the jock? Quarterback, I guess. Quarterback. Uh, who are his friends on the team? You got the big uh, fat guy. You got okay, you got the <laughs> lineman. Okay, you got the yeah. lineman. Who else? See, but I, I don't know anything about football. No, so you're, already... <laughs> you're, you're, you're already there. Okay, you have the lineman, and who else should be there? Um, if you one got of the... his friends is a big fat guy, who's the, who's the other friend? Got to have the skinny guy. That's okay, the skinny the, guy. The weak guy. Yeah. Uh, okay, who, uh, so you don't know anything about football, but, but uh, the, uh, they, the team can only win when they get the nerd laid. So who else needs to be there? Well, you gotta have your nerd. You're the nerd, okay. You gotta have the I, the most attractive girl in the school. The girl, and what what position? What what does she do? Uh, in Head this? cheerleader, of course. Cheerleader, and then who's the, who's the? Uh, then there's a coach, right? Okay, sure. Okay, uh, and how is the cheerleader uh, connected to the coach? Uh, daughter. Daughter, okay. Because one of the things that Moliere teaches us is that comedy is a closed universe because mm. uh, the old guy who's wandering around. In Act One, always turns out to be the uncle of the two orphans in Act Five. So okay, <laughs> right. you, have the, you have the quarterback, the linebacker, the wide receiver. That's the skinny guy, the nerd, the cheerleader, the coach. Okay, nerd Steve Carell, quarterback Paul Rudd, line uh, big lineman Seth Rogen, um, uh, skinny guy Romney Malco, cheerleader a young Catherine Keener, coach Jane. Lake. <laughs> You've just given me the the cast of Forty Year Old Virgin. Wow, there's a reason why these. These these archetypical characters appear and reappear and reappear because they tell stories. You can tell any story you want if you have all the right characters there. That was pretty mind blowing. I like that. <laughs> that was our TED Talk moment for the uh, conversation. Well, tell uh, Ted. Tell Ted. I, I applied to Ted. <laughs> they haven't gotten back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought that would be a great TED Talk. Well, they listen to this, so you know, just just wait. It'll happen. Uh, so Ted listens as well as the French. This is- yes, and, and Rob Schneider. And Rob Schneider. Rob, <laughs> I love you. Copy guy. That was the best thing on SNL. Okay. <laughs> um, so I want to talk for a second also about uh, Ben Stiller because you mentioned Ben Stiller in your, your book. Um, and one oh, of the things that – book? I, I have uh, skimmed the book. Unfortunately, okay. my um, – my, uh, credit card got had some problems at Amazon, so I had to go back and change some things, and then buy it again. And then I was the clock was against me, so I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. So okay. I'm gonna, but I I do a lot of my stuff is from other podcasts and from okay. uh, you know YouTube. So luckily, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. Um, okay. So if if any of my questions sound exactly the same as some other people's, no, no, no. Listen, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think I ever insulted as many people on other podcasts as, <laughs> well, as I have on yours. I am honored. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to talk about Ben Stiller for a second because you, you, okay. you know, you talk about him, and one of the things that I, I remember when Ben was, you know, my buddy Ben uh, first kind of was getting popularity was that the kind of comedy that he was doing was so like not um obvious i guess you could say it was just he was so much the character and so uncomfortable and so kind of you know different than what i had seen before and there have probably been other people who have, have done that kind of um comedy you know like there's something about mary and stuff like that but i just for some reason that just stayed in my mind is that being you know why is that funny why is what he's doing funny and, you know, why is just his nervousness or his like being in that situation making me laugh? And I had never really felt like that with anybody else. You know what I mean? Well, I, I think because one of the things that he does well now, he's a smart guy, right? I mean, he had his own sketch show on Fox when he was in his 20s. Uh, he's a smart guy, but he lets himself be seen as less than smart mm-hmm. very well uh, in there's something about Mary uh, he's about to go on a date with Mary, and Chris Elliott's telling him, 
Uh, have you, uh, you know, pulled, pulled the pud? Have you, you know, spanked the monkey? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, have you flogged the dolphin? And, and rather than Ben Stiller going, what are you talking about? He goes, huh? Huh? And what are great comedy lines? Because they see something. They're just not quite sure what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he lets himself be talked into, you know, uh, masturbating just be, just before the date. Uh, and and it's it's ridiculous. It's you know it's it's gross out humor, but there's something very vulnerable, mm-hmm. and uh, and 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 not in charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that I think appeals to all of us because that's how we feel. We feel that we're not completely in charge. That we're uh, that we're less than. And he embodies less than in a very unforced way. He doesn't pretend to be less than. He just mm-hmm. is. There's one of my favorite moments in There's Something About Mary is when they do the flashback and he's about to ask take Mary out to the prom and he's got these great braces on and he's wearing this taupe uh, tuxedo. Mm-hmm. He goes <laughs> to the door and uh, David Keith, who I believe is playing the dad, comes out. David Keith is an African-American. Mary, of course, is Cameron Diaz, who's not African-American. So, he, you know, Ben Stiller looks at David Keith, looks up at the door number, am I in the right place? Usually that gets a laugh just by not being sure. And then David Keith says, she's already gone to the, gone to the prom with Woogie. <laughs> and he goes, Woogie? Yeah, Woogie. <laughs> and then... And you can't really see this over a podcast, but I'm kind of grinning sadly. I'm going, okay. And I usually, (laughs) uh, when I do my workshops, um, by the way, I have a workshop coming up uh, uh, at the end of January, which we'll talk about hopefully at the end of the podcast. Uh, I usually freeze frame on that. And I say, if the movie ended there, hasn't, hasn't he broken your heart? That's the essence of comedy. Is the essence of comedy is not to pretend that there's no pain. It's all silliness. The essence of comedy is we're always in pain. Life is a painful, painful deal. How are we going to deal with it? What, what are we going to do? The comedian is the courageous person who gets up in front of a group of strangers and, and admits to being human and, and basically says, you know, gives a shrug and says, you'll live. It's tough. You get kicked, but you'll live. And that's a very life affirming way of looking at the world. So, so if that was written as a drama and not a comedy, well, what do if you it think was written as difference? a drama, uh, he wouldn't be an idiot. He would know more. Uh, he would be good looking. He wouldn't be wearing braces. Like I said, if it was a drama, he would be something that we would aspire to mm-hmm. as opposed to something who we can recognize as us. Look at the movie that at, I always. Sorry, Look at ahead. the Maze Runner or the Divergent. Those kids are gorgeous. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in the apocalypse, are we all going to look that good? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, of course. Am I going to have capped teeth, you know, in, in a dystopian <laughs> future? I wish. You know, that would be great. Uh-huh. <laughs> Only the good looking survive. <laughs> One of my favorite Ben Stiller performances is in uh, Tropic Thunder. Oh, my fa- one of my favorite movies. When he is, you know, captured and they make him reenact his character. <laughs> Simple Jack. Simple Jack. That to me is like the pinnacle of his uh, his career. But but the moment that I love is when he and Robert Downey have the conversation about why he didn't get the Oscar. Yeah, exactly. You know, there were times when I was doing Jack that I actually felt retarded, like really retarded. I mean, I brushed my teeth retarded. I... Road bus retarded. Damn. In a weird way, I had to sort of just free myself up to believe that it was okay to be stupid or dumb. To be a moron. Yeah. To be moronical. Exactly. To be a moron. An imbecile. Yeah. Like the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. When I was playing the character. When you was a character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as Jack. Definitely. Yeah. Jack. Stupid ass Jack. Trying to come back from that. In a weird way, it was almost like I had to sort of fool my mind into believing that it wasn't retarded. And by the end of the whole thing, I was like, wait a minute, you know? I flushed so much out, how am I going to jumpstart it up again? It's just like... Yeah. Yeah, right? You was farting in bathtubs and laughing your ass off. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. But Simple Jack thought he was smart. Or rather, didn't think he was retarded, so he can't afford to play retarded being a smart actor. Playing a guy who ain't smart but thinks he is, that's tricky. Hmm. Tricky. It's like working with Mercury. It's high science, man. It's art form. Yeah. You an artist. Hmm. That's what we do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hats off for going there. Especially knowing not the Academy is about that shit. Mm-mm. Wait. About what? You're serious? You don't know. <laughs> Everybody knows you never go full retard. What do you mean? Check it out. Dustin Hoffman, Ray Man, look retarded, act retarded, not retarded. Cat two picks, cheated cards, autistic, show, not retarded. You got Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump. Slow, yes, retarded, maybe, braces on his legs, but he charmed the pants off next to him and won a ping pong competition. That ain't retarded. And he was a goddamn war hero. Right. You know any retarded war heroes? You went full retard, man. Never go for retard. You don't buy that? Yeah, Sean Penn, 2001, I am saying. Remember? Went for retard. Went home empty handed. And, and that's such a beautiful moment because it's the first moment in the film where they're really just relating to each other and they're connecting mm-hmm. and they're not, they, they've let their, their rivalries go. And, and Robert Downey goes, You don't know? <laughs> you can't go full Todd. You went full Todd. You can go half Todd. You can't go full Todd. <laughs> Great, great. Yeah. I mean, uh, those those human, simple human moments where people share what makes them vulnerable, what makes them silly, what makes them lost, what makes them human. And 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 that's that's why in in terms of straight line wavy line, uh, you you know, Mork is funny, but you can't have Mork without Mindy. Mm-hmm. You got to have a human being in the equation at every moment. So even your silliest character uh, can have a moment where they're human, and they're having a human experience um, while everybody else is acting crazy around them. And that's yeah. why the division of funny guy and straight man is is incorrect because everybody gets to has a chance <clears throat> to be mm-hmm. funny. Everybody has a chance to be, you know, the the sane one. Well, I, tell me if, if you had the same feeling as I did, but watching that, if you, you've got Robert Downey Jr., you've got Ben Stiller, and then you've got Jack Black. And Jack Black, to me, like most of the stuff that he did in the film kind of fell flat, though. I don't know how you, you kind of perceived well, that, but it just I, seemed I, like I, one more person there that like didn't necessarily like add to it. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I can see that point of view. I, I'm not going to argue that he's the best thing in the film but he's there because you needed a primal character okay again we go we go back to to our typical characters the archetypes the commedia you have your clever tricky servant that's uh robert downey jr uh you have your nerdy guy that's jay baruchel you have your idiot that's uh or your fool yeah that's that's ben stiller uh then you have your primal character you know, and he's got he's got primal needs. I need I need my drugs, um, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and out of that mix comes comes the comes this disjointed, uh, dysfunctional family that all comedy aspires to. All comedy, especially television comedy, aspires to create dysfun- large dysfunctional families that that we can relate to, and in some way. Uh, enjoy being with because they remind us of our dysfunctional families only we don't have to be with them that much so okay. so yeah so is is jack Black <laughs> the you know is that a oscar oscar nominated performance I, i'm not sure but i i see the i see the use for him okay. because you need that unbridled energy now is that unbridled energy the best it could be i don't know i i i wasn't crazy about the uh about the 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 blonde uh buzz cut um but um you know <laughs> I, I, I mean i was just wondering if there was something we're not available <laughs> right i mean yeah, that would be true. that would be john belushi or john candy or chris farley that would be their role that's yeah. what they would be there for and maybe they would have brought a little bit more what i call the shemp factor you know so shemp was the stooge that made you care so that's what John Candy and Chris Farley would do. They would make you care. 
And Jack Black, I guess, just didn't make you care that much because Jack Black, if, if I'm going to analyze it from your point of view, Jack Black gave was too much a performance that he was outside of as opposed to owning it. He wasn't sharing his addiction. He was making this character's addiction uh, the, the, the focus. And, and when you distance yourself from your character and you distance yourself from the audience, there's, there's that distancing factor that doesn't work for some people. In 500 BC, the first comedy written, the actor comes out and talks to the audience directly in a different way than they did in Greek tragedy. There's a connection that comics make with their audience. It's an actor-centric art, and it's about telling the truth about what's happening right in front of all of us. I'm an actor. I'm on stage. You're watching me. Let's go. And so there's truth there. And so you might be you might be reacting to the fact that he wasn't as connected and as truthful as the other actors. That's my guess. But it didn't bother me as much. But I can see from your point of I, uh, taking a look from your perspective, I can see what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of fell flat sometimes. I'm I'm going yeah, to. He just was. He he fucking sucked. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like late Jerry Lewis, like you're saying. It just felt like a performance, you know. Anyway. Right. I'll get I, off that. <laughs> All right. Um, we're, we're at about an hour. I wanted to uh, make sure that you discuss the things that are coming up with you and how people can get in touch and sign up for your classes. Um, okay. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah. I'm Libra. I'm lonely. <laughs> I like long, walk- long walks on the beach. Good, I'm on sna- No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm happily married. Uh, but, um, you can, uh, you can tweet me at, uh, at SK comedy. That's S K comedy comedy with a C. Cause I'm not a hack. I don't do that comedy <laughs> K thing. My website is Kaplan comedy, one word, dot com, And you can email me at Steve at Kaplan comedy, dot com. And, uh, right now, uh, in January 30th and 31st in Los Angeles, we're having a workshop uh, at uh, the Marriott Burbank and you can register for it online and if you're in Ireland uh, we're, we're going to be in Ireland in early June uh, London the week later uh, I think we're going to be in Paris in April and we're going to be in Denver in October and you should read my book The Hidden Tools of Comedy We it's translated into Russian, Chinese and French but for you for the Indie Film Academy podcast <laughs> uh, listeners we have it for you in English, wow. and it's, avail- it's available on, on Kindle. You can download it, but make sure that your credit card doesn't get screwed up like Jason's, and, uh, <laughs> and it's also available uh, through Amazon, um, and you can also buy it on our website for an autographed copy. All right, that's going to do it for today. I want to thank my guest, Steve Kaplan of KaplanComedy.com. Um, I really had a great time talking with him. If you want to join the conversation, don't forget to check us out on Twitter at IndieFilmACDMY, or you can go to our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash group slash IndieFilmAcademy. And we I post a bunch of stuff up there that people post their films and they post interesting articles. It's just a really great way to interact interact with everybody. And of course, don't forget to go to IndieFilmAcademy.com and sign up for our newsletter. I'm always sending out interesting articles and discounts on our classes and things like that. So check it out. All right, guys, thanks again for listening and we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.IndieFilmAcademy.com. Where the hell are we? Dang Crook River. Yes, sir? How do you know that? How you sure? Only one way to find out, dude. What do you mean, you people? Huh? I, I think what uh, Tug means is you no, people, you actors, you people. Look at his ass, man. Look at that beady. What the hell?